Hello and welcome to this final discussion in our three-part series, Researching the Pandemic, Critical Conversations, hosted by University Libraries. Librarians, by the nature of our work at the Center of Intellectual Inquiry on campus, have a unique opportunity to regularly interact with research endeavors from a wide range of academic disciplines and act as stewards of multidisciplinary resources necessary to tackle complex problems such as the current public health crisis. As such, this discussion offers something of a behind the scenes look into this unique period of research and how it's been approached and some of the challenges and opportunities that have arisen from researching both about and during a global pandemic. In today's discussion, we're joined by panelists who have investigated different aspects of social inequality surrounding COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed several types of social inequality already present in American and global societies. For example, this pandemic has impacted communities such as African Americans, Native Americans, low income families, and incarcerated people in a disproportionate manner. In this panel, a historian and a social scientist will join us, will join with subject librarians in a discussion of social inequality in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. All of the questions that will be asked in today's panel, along with relevant citations, are available at a link that I will put in the chat in just a moment, and also on the web page for this event that is shown at the bottom of the slide. So if you wish to follow along or refer back to that information, it will be available. So leading this discussion today, we have Maria Sclafani, Coordinator of Library Instruction, Instructional Services and Assistant Professor and she is the liaison librarian for the College of Applied Studies. Her research interests include library instruction pedagogy and information needs of people who are incarcerated. We also have Ethan Lindsay, humanities and social sciences librarian and assistant professor. He is the liaison librarian to the Department of History, Criminal Justice, Sociology, Political Science, and Religion. And his research interests include history of libraries and digital humanities. And with that, I will turn it over to Ethan to introduce our panelists today. Thank you, Megan, and thank you for all of the work you've done um, organizing this series this semester. So um, we're really pleased, we're really, really grateful to have two remarkable panelists today. So first, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Robert Weems. Um, Dr. Weems is the Willard W. Garvey Distinguished Professor of Business History here at Wichita State. Um, he completed a PhD in history at University of Wisconsin-Madison. His specialty is African-American business history, um, but he teaches really broadly in the areas of African-American history and U.S. history. Um, he's published four books, uh, most recently uh, this book here, so The Merchant Prince of Black Chicago, Anthony Overton, and the Building of a Financial Empire. Uh, and I'm pleased to, to say that we have all of these books um, uh, available through the university libraries. Okay, and we also are, are very grateful uh, to have Dr. Brianna Beaupre. Uh, Dr. Beaupre is uh, an assistant professor in the School of Criminal Justice here at Wichita State. Uh, she did her PhD um, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, and her, her research interests are the, the U.S. criminological and correctional processes, um, and she focuses really on these issues of gender, race, and families. Um, she's published a number of peer-reviewed publications, articles in journals such as uh, Feminist Criminology, so we're, we're grateful that both of these um, esteemed panelists, esteemed professors are here today. Um, I do I do want to announce that um, um, for today's panel discussion, um, for most of the, the main part of the event, uh, Marie and I will, will alternate um, asking the, the, the panelists questions, uh, trying to generate discussion. Um, we, we do want to emphasize that um, we will leave time uh, for audience questions near the end of our time today. So, so we're, we're grateful that you're here. Uh, we're grateful that you uh, see this uh, topic as important uh, and, and 
thank you very much for being here. So, so now I'm going to turn things over um, to Maria uh, for our first uh, couple of questions. Thanks so much, Ethan. Um, a leaf blower just walked by my office, so <laughs> hopefully <laughs> it's not too loud. Um, and we do have all of the questions that and the references for those questions available in an open Google Doc, um, which I'm sure Megan can share in the chat. Um, so I just wanted to mention that in advance. Um, and so the first question we had for the panelists is um, a column by Doyle McManus in the Los Angeles Times has called the coronavirus the great unequalizer because this pandemic has impacted poor people, ethnic minorities, and other marginalized groups in disproportionate ways. Based on your research and your discipline, how do you make sense of the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted marginalized communities, communities such as African-Americans and people who are incarcerated? Um, I, I can go first if you like. <laughs> um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, as Dr. Lindsay mentioned, I study incarcerated populations and how COVID-19 has impacted them as well as their family members on the outside. Um, so largely what goes on in prisons in a normal time, you know, non-pandemic era, there's already a lack of transparency and many of these individuals are out of sight, out of mind. They're located in prisons that are symbolically away from our community and largely what goes on in those prisons is not well known to the public. And so what we do know about incarcerated settings is that the conditions are more conducive to the spread and you know, health complications from coronavirus. And so that's due to these conditions where it's, a, it's literally impossible to social distance. Um, it, often in prisons, including Lansing Prison here in Kansas, there's dorm-like settings where it's bunk beds in an open room and it makes it really impossible to stop the spread of the disease. Even in cells, the, the entire cell might be six feet wide, so six by six. So how can you social distance more than six feet when that's your entire living space and you're sharing it with at least one other person. And so our, our prisons in Kansas have been overcrowded um, before the pandemic. And so that's another issue that we have more people than are at the capacity for our prisons. And so social distancing is a huge issue that makes it, you know, these marginalized individuals even more difficult to stop the spread. And even when we think about the medical care in incarcerated settings, which is only a, a little piece of my research, but what, what I do know about it is that experts refer to it as subpar medical care. It's not the same type of care that you would receive on the outside in the community. So even when you are diagnosed with coronavirus on the inside, you may not be getting the same medical attention as you would if you were not incarcerated. And so these prisons, just the way this, that they're designed and managed, are not conducive to stopping the spread of a virus like COVID-19. And so that's why we see this increased exposure and also increased health complications among incarcerated people. Yeah, and when we look at the, you know, the African-American community, there's been a long-standing disparity between uh, particular numbers in the larger society and, and numbers in the African-American community. In, in, in my realm of inquiry, just to give you an example in terms of business and economics, you know, there's a popular saying that when the broader economy catches a cold, uh, the black community catches pneumonia, that whatever we see happening in, in the broader society, uh, we see it having an especially dramatic impact on, on African-Americans. Uh, one of the interesting uh, dynamics of, of the disparities associated with COVID-19 as it relates to the African-American community is that, for instance, a lot of us who are professors and, and other types of professionals, we've been able to work at home during the pandemic with no particular problem. However, a lot of African-Americans have been deemed, you know, so-called essential workers and literally have to go out and have been going out on a daily basis 
since the beginning of the pandemic. And this causes all sorts of problems, not just for them at their workplaces. Uh, they may be taking, bringing the virus home. And, and speaking of home, uh, though it's not as, the space isn't as tight as uh, uh, Professor Bopri described in prisons, a lot of African-Americans live in, in substandard uh, living facilities, which makes all the more difficult. And, and, and another dynamic of COVID-19 that oftentimes doesn't get discussed as much as it should is the economic fallout. While there's a medical fallout, there's also been a very significant economic fallout. Specifically, uh, small business in America is literally crumbling and disappearing uh, before our eyes. And when we look at African-American small businesses, we see a sector of the American economy that's really under a lot of pressure because among other things, a lot of small black business people have not had, had access to the PPP program, which has helped subsidize a lot of other businesses through this very uh, significant economic as well as medical emergency. Absolutely. Um, thanks to both of our panelists um, for their really in-depth answers. Um, the next question that we want to ask is, um, Ethan and I kind of want to take a minute essentially to recognize the significance and magnitude of the protests that have taken place this year amid the pandemic um, in the wake of the unjust killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and numerous others. Um, according to the New York Times, an estimated 15 million to 26 million people participated in protests in May and early June alone um, of this year, making them the largest social movement in the country's history. Um, so what do recent protests indicate about the extent of social injustice in the United States? Um, yeah, so I think there's been a lot of attention recently, but I do want to highlight that 2020 is not distinct. Systemic racism has persisted, um, you know, as, as our fellow panelists will suggest, I'm sure, to the history of this country. You know, it, it, these protests have heightened attention and brought social action, but we still have a long way to go towards anti-racism. And so scholars in my field, which again is criminal justice and I focus on carceral spaces, it's not a coincidence that the most marginalized are disproportionately incarcerated relative to their representation in the general public. Kansas is no exception. Black Latinx individuals are more likely to be incarcerated in comparison to their white counterparts. And our nation you know, tends to criminalize and surveil communities that are impoverished and or of color. And this leads to a disproportionate contact with law enforcement, police, and those interactions are more likely to result in use of force among Black individuals. And so, again, you know, it, it's brought attention and it's bringing hopefully social change, but I do want to highlight that this is an issue that has been occurring throughout our history, you know, over time. Yeah, to, to piggyback off of that, uh, when we look at what happened uh, beginning around Memorial Day with George Floyd and, and for the early part of the summer, uh, that literally just represented the latest man manifestation of a, of a longstanding problem in this country. What I would say is different as compared to earlier period is that in earlier time, people did not have access to phones where people could literally document uh, forms of state violence against people of African descent. You know, that, that is a, a, a major difference. But in, in thinking about what happened this summer, and again, we saw, you know, large protests throughout the country. And there was really a discussion about, you know, this may be a, a, a real change in terms of national perspective regarding race or sensitivity to racial justice issues. And I think some people sort of uh, with that mindset believe that, you know, November 3rd would show this sort of proverbial 
blue wave of people coming out in mass to protest through the vote, what happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and others. And quite frankly, I think a lot of us were a bit surprised if, to a certain extent that you did not have this blue rate, this blue wave, if you will. And that in fact, in, in the House of Representatives, we saw the Republican party, uh, in fact, uh, making gains. This must suggest on one level that maybe some of what we saw may have been, you know, partially a mirage that in the, in the final analysis, when a lot of white voters, you know, cast their ballot, uh, whiteness, in fact, trumps social justice in terms of their priorities. We suggest that Professor Barpry, Barpry indicated that we, the U.S. has a long way to go in terms of truly being an, an anti-racist country. Absolutely. And Dr. Beaupre, did you want to add anything? Uh, I think I'm I'm good for now. I have more to the next question on the list, so I'm going <laughs> to say some things for that. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. So moving along, um, our next question will be asked by Ethan. So I'll mute myself. Yeah. So um, we're just going to build on this discussion that that um, both of our panel panelists have 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 been having about this idea of systemic racism. So, so you know, there, there are these discussions in American public life about, about this idea of systemic racism. Um, and according to the encyclopedia of, of race and racism, racism is a system of advantage and disadvantage based on social, historical, and cultural constructions of race and ethnicity. So, so what impact do, do, does racism, especially if this is understood as a system of advantage and disadvantage, what impact does that have on the communities that you have studied? So my research has focused on race more in the context of intersectionality and Black women's experiences as well as Latina women and Native American women in relation to white women. Um, and so what I found from my own research is that racial disparities exist at every single phase of the legal system. There's discretion at every single decision point, starting with who to stop and search. And all of that is shaped by larger social structures and social hierarchies, including white supremacy, racism, that penetrates every aspect of our system. And it shows through the criminal justice system systematically in all these different decision points that disadvantage people of color. And so what that looks like from my own research is that black women have been seven times as likely to be incarcerated in comparison to their white counterparts. My qualitative research, so interviewing women who've been system involved about their own experiences, their interactions with police, with the courts, with corrections, I found that white women tend to benefit from white privilege through decreased suspicion and increased leniency relative to black women. So I know when we discuss systemic racism and racism as a whole, often the focus is on how this impacts people of color, right? We talk about that they're treated more harshly, but I think less of attention is given to, in order for someone to be marginalized, in order for someone to be othered, or treated disproportionately harshly, there has to be another group that's benefiting, that's being treated disproportionately leniently. And so that's a focus of my research area as a white woman. I often partner with scholars of color to look at these racial issues, but as a white woman, I want to bring light to the fact that white privilege does affect our experiences in the legal system and do relate to these disparities. And so I know our topic today is coronavirus. So I wanted to pull a, a statistic, a recent fact that I found from the Kansas City uh, News. And so their uh, reports from the Kansas Department of Corrections data for their yearly coronavirus totals, black people in Kansas prisons have contracted the new coronavirus at a higher rate compared to other groups during the pandemic this year while about 28% of the prison population in Kansas is black, 
those individuals accounted for 37% of COVID-19 cases. And so even when we talk about coronavirus, it's disproportionately impacting people of color in the prison system as well. And so again, we just see it at every phase of their experience in the criminal justice system. When we uh, look at this from, from the standpoint of history, one of the things that I continue to be fascinated by as a historian is that while people of African descent and European descent have inhabited the same land mass for over 400 years, their disparate experiences have generated two entirely different worldviews. Uh, as Malcolm X once famously said, uh, you know, Black people didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. And there's a whole history of disparate treatment of, of African Americans. For instance, uh, Professor Bopri makes the point about disproportionality in the prison system. When you just look at the numbers nationally, when you look at the disproportionate numbers of African Americans in prison as compared to their percentage of the population, this has been a national pandemic, if you will, for decades. When you look at longstanding uh, health disparities in the African American community, you know, such as, you know, the propensity for asthma, the propensity for high blood pressure, the propensity for other types of diseases, it's not coincidental from a purely medical standpoint that when, you know, COVID-19 appeared, that African Americans who as a group have been medically challenged in a variety of ways for a long time would be negative, you know, disproportionately negatively impacted uh, by, by COVID-19. Yes, thank you. So we we were just going to build on that, um, and you you've uh, I think already gone into uh, uh, some some discussion for for our next question. So I'm I'm going to just have a, a couple of couple of questions mainly for Dr. Weems uh, about the African American community, and starting with you know some some of these issues that he's he's um, presenting uh, the impact of COVID-19 on this particular community. So the the nonpartisan APM re research lab has reported that Black Americans have suffered a disproportionate share of coronavirus deaths and are more than twice as likely as whites and Asian Americans to die from the disease. Um, in addition with the job losses uh, th that occurred after the pandemic began, African Americans are one of the demographic groups most affected by the COVID-19 recession. Um, and the, the Washington Post has labeled this, this recession the most unequal uh, recession in modern U.S. history. So, so in in, in this context of, of African American uh, history of the African American experience in U.S. history, um, why just just to, if you will just elaborate a little bit more on why why this community um, is especially vulnerable to to these types of poor health outcomes and the the negative um, economic asp aspects that we're seeing in the pandemic. Well, when we look at African-American history and uh, some of the, the, the negative consequences of, of being a person of African descent uh, in the United States, uh, above and beyond slavery, which is a whole nother discussion. When we look at when the Civil War ended and when African-Americans moved into what some would call so-called freedom, people literally entered freedom was little more than the clothes on their back. They entered into an environment that was overtly hostile on all types of levels, uh, just the stress and strain of being an active, because very interesting too, and again, I'm not a physician, but in looking at uh, African-American history and, and having some knowledge of the medical field, there's a direct correlation between stress levels and your susceptibility to a variety of maladies. And even in 2020, when you look at what I would say the disparate stress levels 
that African Americans have to deal with on a on a daily basis, as compared to their uh, European American counterparts, that in and of itself is yet a contributing factor to why African Americans, you know, contracted COVID nineteen uh, more than some of their other counterparts, and and as I mentioned earlier, uh, most African Americans have been in the category of quote unquote essential workers and literally have to go out on a daily basis in, in the harm's way. And, and literally it all comes down to this basic point of, you know, historically, you know, black lives have really not mattered. And we see, you know, ongoing manifestations of that. And again, to me, when we just look at the history, it's not coincidental that we see this disparate, you know, proportion of African Americans being more adversely affected by COVID-19 than others, because there's a variety of other diseases that if you look at it, we see African Americans disproportionately affected. Uh, is this all just a coincidence? Uh, history suggested, no, it, it's, it's not a coincidence, and it's just a manifestation of long-standing uh, systemic racism where indeed, and, and I'll just share with you a, a, a personal antidote from my own research. I've done a lot of research on, on African, on, on, ins on the insurance industry. And there was a point in time where the insurance industry literally refused to, you know, to cover African-Americans at all or charge African Americans higher premiums than their white counterparts based upon the fact that African Americans had higher death rates and, and other, other maladies. So yeah, this is a, a long standing phenomenon that I think COVID-19 is just the latest manifestation of. Yeah, th thank you for that. Thanks for uh, helping us understand that um, uh, better. And, you know, I, I you, you mentioned in one of your earlier answers, just you, you alluded to uh, the current environment we're in and uh, the, the recent election. So, you know, I, I'm going to ask a question sort of more generally about, um, you know, this, this issue of voting and elections. And, you know, the, the act of voting really is at the, the very center of a democracy. Um, you know, it's, it's how um, – uh, in one way, you know, change, change can be made with, within a democratic system. So, so of course, um, e efforts to, to make voting um, more difficult for certain communities, especially African Americans, have, have been fairly well documented uh, in, in recent elections in, in this country, in the U.S. So, so how might we understand these examples of, of voter suppression uh, in the larger context of, of African American history? Well, uh, the, the quintessential form of voter suppression occurred in the late 19th century when you had African Americans totally taken off the voting rolls in the South. Uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the vast majority of African Americans you know, lived in the South. And with the rise of, you know, things like the grandfather clause and literacy tests and, and, and what have you, you know, that's again, the quintessential form of voter suppression. You just uh, erase people from the voting rolls. Uh, we saw through a variety of activities associated with the black freedom movement, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which gave protections to people in the former Confederacy but we also know in 2013 that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was in fact uh, diminished. So we have been in a political setting in the past few years now where essentially the Republican Party has been at the core of a lot of these efforts to suppress the black vote. They have felt empowered to do whatever possible, either through the post office or, or what have you to suppress the black vote. But on a larger, and put this in a larger context, we put this in the international context. The US historically has, you know, 
quote unquote, prided itself on American exceptionalism, the beacon, beacon of light on the hill, the bastion of democracy. And people across the, you know, people in the United States haven't been the only people that have been aghast at the very obvious and blatant attempts to suppress the vote of black and, and other marginalized groups. But other people around the world have seen very clearly you know, the shenanigans that have taken place the past several months. And I would argue that one of the, you know, lingering reverberations of what we've seen is that America will never be viewed the same internationally in terms of democracy. And because we know historically America, you know, tried to lecture other countries about holding fair elections, you know, after what we've seen the past several months, you know, those days are over in terms of America being a moral authority in the context of democracy and open and fair elections. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that uh, reflection. Uh, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna turn it now over to Maria. She's gonna have a few questions for, for Dr. Beaupre. I, I do have one thing to add about voting, if I could real quick. Um, Please. Okay, so um, felony disenfranchisement is an issue that also disproportionately impacts people of color, particularly Black Americans. So felony disenfranchisement means that when someone has a felony record in states across the U.S., they all have different laws, but typically states have restrictions on whether those individuals with records can vote. So it depends on the state. Um, so for example, if you're on probation or parole here in, in, in different states, you might not have access to voting. If you're incarcerated in most states, you don't have access to voting. Um, some of those restrictions are being lightened. So to allow more people with felony records to vote. But as a whole, what we see across the US is you know, there, there are very real restrictions on their ability to practice civil participation, civic engagement. And so this disproportionately impacts Black Americans because Black Americans are more likely to be incarcerated. And so from the U.S. Sentencing Project, they found that one in 16 Black Americans of voting age are disenfranchised, meaning that they're not allowed to vote. And this rate is 3.7 times greater than other racial groups over 6.2% of the adult black population is disenfranchised in comparison to only 1.7% of other racial groups. And so like Dr. Weems mentioned, this, this is certainly an issue for incarcerated or, or for African-American community, but then you factor on a felony record and it's even harder to vote. Absolutely. Um, and I know that um, previously the state of Florida um, had voted to give felons the right of vote, right to vote, um, and that that was complicated through some um, legal measures um, by the state GOP, um, which resulted in them essentially creating this system of fines, very large fines that um, people who were incarcerated who are felons um, or who have felonies in their criminal record um, had to pay before they could vote. Um, and a lot of attention has been paid to that um, in this election cycle because um, there have been all of these large uh, nonprofit groups aimed at paying those fines at fundraising. Um, so that's just one state that, that comes to mind that I think a lot of attention has been um, paid to in this election in particular. Um, and I, I'll move on to um, the questions that I have for you, Dr. Beaupre. Um, and the first one, um, I, you have gone into this a little bit already, um, but I'll go ahead and ask the question anyway. Um, so there's a really long and well-documented history of poor hygiene conditions in prisons um, due to overcrowding, which you mentioned, um, a lack of cleaning supplies, so there's also like, you know, lots and lots of records of people, of women who were incarcerated saying that essentially they did all their cleaning with menstrual pads, that that was what was available to them. Um, and then also a lack of adequate medical care, which you mentioned, um, a lack of accurate consumer health information. 
Um, so because the majority of prisons and jails do not have internet access, um, a lot of consumer health information is publicly freely available on the internet, but people who are incarcerated don't have access to it. Um, and then also there's infrequent cleaning of facilities and that, you know, like I said, that's been going on for a very long time. So these conditions create a sort of perfect storm for the spread of a highly contagious virus like COVID-19. Um, so what do we know about the spread of COVID-19 in jails and prisons? Well, I do have some unfortunate news, which is that we don't know enough. Um, and so part of that is due to the lack of transparency in reporting um, both the number of in individuals who are incarcerated and staff who are tested and the outcomes of those tests and demographic situations. So we, we really don't know enough to say for sure what the prevalence is. So because of that, there has been a act presented um, called the COVID-19 and Corrections Data Transparency Act, which is pushing for state prisons and the Bureau of Prisons, which is the federal level, to grant access to that data and for them to track it in the first place. And so, you know, I want to preface with that, like we don't have enough information, but from what we do know, um, early studies are suggesting that the infection rate of COVID-19 in prisons is 5.5 times higher than in the general population. And the death rate for those who are incarcerated is 3.3 times higher than the general population. And so a lot of that is because of what I talked about earlier and what, you know, we're talking about now, which is the lack of social distancing, the overcrowding, the lack of cleaning supplies. Um, so I've been interviewing family members of incarcerated people due to this lack of transparency. Um, it was back in April that I started this project because we didn't really know what was going on inside prisons. And there wasn't a lot being communicated to the public. And so because of that, I started a mixed method study um, using surveys with over 300 family members across 40 states and in-depth interviews with a subset of that sample of 35 family members and asking them, you know, since I can't directly access the people who are in prison at a national level, like on a, on a quick level, right? Because accessing that population you have to go through a lot of hoops and things. And so we wanted to get this information quickly to understand how the pandemic was impacting them. We interviewed these family members. Some of the things that they reported happening to their loved ones on the inside was a lack of access to hand sanitizer. It is considered contraband in the vast majority of incarcerated settings. Yet we know that, you know, on the outside, we're always putting our hand sanitizer on. We know that that's a way the CDC guidelines have told us is a way to reduce the spread, but it's considered contraband in incarcerated settings because of the alcohol content. And so that's an issue. Also beyond hand sanitizer, there's been reports of watered down cleaning supplies. So, you know, prisons are stressed financially um, because of overcrowding and an assortment of other reasons. And so, their cleaning supplies, everything given to them is subpar, including the medical treatment. And so because of that, these conditions are just not conducive to containing the spread of a virus. And so, yeah, that's what we're seeing is, you know, they're disproportionately likely to be exposed to the virus, and then they're disproportionately likely to have health-related complications from it. Absolutely. And I was just going to mention really briefly um, before I move on. Um, there is a source which is cited um, in the document along with this question um, with information um, from the Central California Women's Facility, um, mm -hmm. which is one of the largest um, women's prisons, and it is federal and the people who are incarcerated there have internet access. Um, and so what the, um, the 19th, um, which is the news organization that published this article, they were able to get information directly from people who were incarcerated via email. And what they were finding out was that people who were testing positive for COVID-19 were being quarantined with their like bunk mates mm -hmm. who were testing negative for COVID-19. So at least in this one particular instance, we're seeing um, 
actions taken that um, are likely to increase the spread of the virus, which is deeply concerning. I've um, heard that from family members I've talked to too. And, you know, medical quarantine is different from solitary confinement, which is punishment. And so what a lot of institutions are using because they don't have the resources and the space, they're using solitary to medically quarantine, which is not the same thing. Yeah, it's not at all. Um, all right, next question is, um, could you describe what the Kansas Department of Corrections has done to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 um, in prisons within this state? Sure. Um, so as of today, I just pulled these, these data today because they change every day. Um, so far, we have 3,653 cases among incarcerated people in Kansas with eight deaths. And there have been 474 positive cases with three deaths. So that's what where we're at as of today. Um, I will say that at the height of the pandemic, so we're talking like late March, um, Lansing Prison was a hot spot and gained national attention um, because of the high increase at a really fast rate. And as of today, 90% of that incarcerated population has tested positive for COVID. And so they were really concerning at first. And, and part of why I studied that I started this project with families was because um, one of my students actually sent me a Facebook post of an incarcerated individual had a cell phone in prison. Um, that's considered contraband, by the way, you're not supposed to have a cell phone in prison, but they had one inside and took videos of the conditions inside. And so they were protesting those conditions because they weren't being given access to things that would help prevent the spread. And also they were being housed right next to those who had tested positive. And so, you know, the way for them to speak out, it, it's, it's not a normal situation where you can just tweet about it, right? Like they, they don't have access to this information and access to having a voice to speaking out. And so the way, you know, that they addressed it was protesting peacefully. Um, so that was in the media in Kansas and also had national attention. Because of that, the National Guard was brought into that prison and has since reduced the spread. So they've been doing things to combat the spread. It was once a hot spot. I remember when I first was compiling data about COVID-19, Kansas was the eighth highest uh, for the rate of cases among incarcerated people. We're now below that around the national average. So we, our state has addressed some of the issues that have been going on. I, of course, I wouldn't say uh, we're perfect, um, but we, our state is doing things like increased testing, limiting movement, wearing masks, and limiting outside contact. So that's really been their response. But these responses have negative consequences, right? So if we're limiting visitation, which makes sense, we don't want outside people coming in, it's not only affecting incarcerated people, it's also impacting their families. And what we've been finding from our research is that during the pandemic, these incarcerated individuals have had decreased access to communication, meaning they've had decreased access to phones due to lockdowns. They've had decreased access to video visitation for those prisons that even offer it. It's more rare for them to actually offer that. And so because of that, family members are kind of left on the outside, not really knowing what's happening to their loved one on the inside. And even when they do get to talk to them, it might be for five to 10 minutes at a time. And it's in a stress mode. It's like, are you okay? What's happening? It's not the same relationship. And so that's really what my research has been about is how this pandemic, right? Having a family member incarcerated is already a stressful experience enough. I can say that because both my parents were incarcerated. So I've experienced it, not in a pandemic. Um, but now you factor in a global pandemic where you have decreased access to communication. You're worried about your loved one in this environment where you know there's an increased risk and you know there's an increased spread. You know that medical care is subpar and you feel helpless. And so that's really what my research has been focused on. Um, absolutely. So thank you uh, for sharing that. And um, the next question that we have is, um, so what 
um, information about COVID-19 um, prevention and treatment is available to people who are incarcerated um, that, that you know of? Yeah, so I don't know, like, I just know what families have told me, right? So like, I'm not asking them super detailed, like, what exactly do they know? But what I do know from the interviews with families is that their access to information on the inside is very limited. And it's often what staff choose to tell them, which can often be counter to what we're hearing, you know, in the media or from the CDC. So they're really, you know, left to the mercy of these correctional facilities for treatment and for information. Absolutely. Um, and even uh, some, again, this is some research that's, there's a citation um, in the documentation. Um, there were some librarians um, in Texas who were providing consumer health reference information to people who are in the state of Texas. And this was pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and what they found was incredibly disturbing. Um, people were, you know, needing really basic consumer health information that, um, like I said, is, is freely available. Um, they had an instance where someone asked for information about how to um, stop the spread of shingles. Mm -hmm. um, someone who's incarcerated took that responsibility on themselves. Um, to ask, and this is a snail mail reference program, so it is slow, because they said, there's someone in my cell block who, um, <laughs> there's someone in my cell block who, who has this, and we want to know what we can do to stop the spread. So right. it's, it's deeply concerning, um, which kind of leads to the final question I had for you, um, which was, how might a lack of internet access limit the information available to people who were incarcerated? I don't know about y'all on this panel and like, you know, out there listening. When the pandemic first hit, I was on the internet nonstop searching what is happening? How does this impact our community? You know, what can I do to stop the spread, to prevent myself, to prevent this from my family? Imagine this, you know, hearing about COVID-19 and you're in a prison cell and you literally have no access to information on the outside. You have lockdowns, so you can't even talk to your loved one. You don't know if your loved one on the outside is, is safe, is okay, right? Like, so just imagine, like, how stressful that situation would be to have this lack of, of access to information. And like I mentioned, cell phones are considered contraband. Somehow they can get in, but not everybody has access, right? So it's, it's just this situation where we're limiting access, I mean, it's really cutting them off from the outside world, which can negatively impact them because if they don't have, you know, the right information or understand what's happening, how are they going to know, you know, what they can do personally, what little agency they have, how can they know like what to do to stop the spread and to protect themselves? And so largely incarcerated people rely on their family members on the outside to relay information to them. Um, but we know that the most marginalized often have less social support on the outside. And so this, again, is a multiplicative marginalization where, you know, these individuals may have even less access to information. And then they're relying on word of mouth or staff, which may not always be correct. And so it's a huge issue and it's, it's just reflects the prison system as a whole, which is designed to isolate and remove, which, you know, during a pandemic, there's specific implications for that. Absolutely. Um, and we, you know, we're going to move into the Q&A portion, but before we do, uh, Dr. Weems, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add um, to the discussion that we've had. Um, well, and, and just, you know, tying in history to uh, Professor Beaupre's discussion of, of the incarcerated, you know, one of the, the sad realities, because clearly she has outlined a system where when you're incarcerated, you literally have little, if any, rights that have to be acknowledged or respected. And, you know, the 13th Amendment, which, you know, I perhaps ironically uh, abolish, you know, the involuntary servitude that African Americans had endured for hundreds of years up to that point, but still kept that 
notion of involuntary servitude or the lack of rights for people who found themselves incarcerated. So yeah, that's a, a partial historical explanation as to why we see this broad disparity between uh, what people who are incarcerated can and cannot do because literally according to the constitution, uh, they have little if any rights that, that anybody is bound to respect. Absolutely. Um, all right, so like I said, we'll we'll move into the Q&A portion of this panel. Um, and thank you to both of our panelists for their really thoughtful and detailed answers to our questions. Um, for anyone um, in the audience, um, if you do have a question for our panelists, please feel free to um, put it in the chat and I'll, I'll be happy to ask it, um, unless you wanna unmute yourself and ask it yourself, which is fine as well. Can I ask a question to Dr. Weems? <laughs> of course, please do. Um, so I always like to end these kind of panels on a, on a positive note and one that, you know, is, is aimed at what we can do. So my question for you, Dr. Weems, is, you know, what can we as a community do to sort of address these disparities related specifically to the Black or African-American community? Great question. And I think one way in which it can be addressed is through vehicles such as this, where people actually openly talk about the obvious disparities and, and, and some of the reasons for it. Because in a, in a very real sense, uh, not to the extent that is the context of people who are incarcerated, who are literally out of sight, out of mind, but in the larger society, and it's been argued, in fact, that one of the reasons why the national response to COVID-19 was relatively slow, because there was an early perception that, oh, only Black people are getting it. So yeah, it's no real national emergency per se. So uh, again, I think just the uh, this type of discussion, and, and, and it all comes back to the history of this country and hopefully a, a possible better future. And that comes down to really squarely facing the past, which deals with entrenched, you know, systematic racism, you know, sort of a truth and reconciliation commission on a very, very serious note, because I think anything other than that of squarely facing the truth we're just going to continue to to spin our wheels. But again, you know, the, the more specifically answer your direct question, I think vehicles such as this are a good way, you know, to begin the process. Because when we look at history and we talk about, you know, African Americans and, and health issues, you know, and I and I mentioned the uh, insurance industry in another context earlier, whereas you know, African Americans were not insured by some companies for an extended period of time, you know, there was this belief in some circles that, you know, Black folks were genetically weak or deficient in some areas that make them more susceptible to, you know, get certain diseases that other parts of the population aren't getting. But again, I think discussions such as this, where we can openly and frankly talk about some of these issues is, is, is a good is, is a good step. I also appreciate like the interdisciplinary focus, you know, like in criminal justice, we have a very specific lens. I, I will say my lens is a little more critical than than typical. Um, but, you know, it's always nice to interact with scholars from across the university as well. So I've really enjoyed this so far and hearing Dr. Weems take on this. Yeah, I, 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 I have the same sentiment because literally, you know, when we look at, you know, the research enterprise, and this is one of the things that just fascinates me as a scholar, that, you know, we all are engaged in research, 
but we all have different approaches. We ask different questions, but when we really break it down and have these types of interdisciplinary conversations, you know, we all are ultimately searching for that elusive thing called truth. And, and in the final analysis, I think, you know, you know, that's what makes what we do as scholars so very, very important. Absolutely. Um, and we, we had a whole bunch of questions come in. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to think about, you know, um, <laughs> which, what, what to start with. Um, I, I'm going to start with um, some questions that are a bit simpler, mm -hmm. um, just in a way to, to sort of try and ensure if possible we can ask or we can answer all these questions. So one I see um, from Ginger Williams um, for Dr. Beaupre. Um, is about whether incarcerated people have access to masks mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hygienic, sterilized, clean masks? Mm -hmm. um, I can say it varies across states. Um, so I have from the Prison Policy Initiative, just real quick. Okay, so um, according to the Prison Policy Initiative, half of the states fail to require mask use by correctional staff and less than a third of facilities require incarcerated people to wear masks. Um, so there's also issues around access to masks. So my home state is Nevada. Um, and my research interviewing family members, I interviewed family members from Kansas, from Texas, from all across the US, including Nevada. And I was disturbed to hear from these family members that their incarcerated loved ones on the outside were told they could not wear masks. Um, and so I'll read you the rationale from the Nevada Department of Corrections website. Um, and so they, they said that masks were restricted due to safety and security reasons as staff must be able to identify all incarcerated people by face at all times, especially during an incident or because wearing masks, they can easily blend in with staff who are also wearing masks, which increases the risk for escape. So this was the rationale. Um, so I'll let, you know, you can have your own opinions about that rationale. Um, all I will say is that there is this conflict in, in correctional settings between, you know, human rights and decency versus safety and security. So at what point do we, you know, give a little to have this increased safety in a height of a pandemic. And so I will say that as of late June, Nevada Department of Corrections did change that policy and did start allowing and providing masks. But we, we know late June, like, you know, like the pandemic started far, far beyond that. And so yeah, I mean, it really just depends on the state. I will say Kansas more recently, you know, has taken it seriously. And from what I've heard, they do have access to masks. Again, we don't know enough because there isn't a ton of transparency. Um, absolutely. And the next question um, is, can prisons be held liable if an inmate um, or someone who's incarcerated dies due to health conditions brought on by their environment? So I will, I will give you full disclosure. I am a criminologist and maybe a penologist, with this, which is studying punishment and crime. I am not so up to date on the law and the legal side. Um, I will say that they can certainly try um, and a place to go for more information about that would likely be the ACLU. And we have an ACLU specific to Kansas. So I would say, you know, if you are interested in more information to go to that website and seek out more. I do know they can try, right? Like they could file something. I don't know the success rate, especially because it's, it's so new and we know how long the legal process takes. Um, but I definitely think that's an important consideration. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that with the caveat that I'm also not a lawyer, um, I do know that, you know, a number of legal cases have been filed by people who are incarcerated um, relating to food and their diet. Um, and most of those cases, um, 
I mean, they're deeply concerning because people who are incarcerated are alleging that they're being fed rotten food, moldy food, food that is inedible and making them ill. Um, there was a more famous lawsuit about this nutritional loaf that was being served to people who are mm-hmm. incarcerated for all, like for all their meals. Um, and the majority of those lawsuits um, have not been successful. So right. judges have basically said, you know, this, <laughs> they are not guaranteed the right to high quality food um so that's that's um one thing that comes to mind for me but there was also a case in florida um with someone named darren rainey he was a person who was incarcerated in florida um, and he died um in a really disturbing way that was absolutely the result of the way that um he was treated by the um guards And his family um, settled a civil rights lawsuit recently against the state of Florida, and his case has led to sweeping reforms in the Florida prison system. Um, I cannot speak to the details of that, but um, that I think is more comparable in that um, this person who who had a mental illness um, was frankly murdered um, (laughs) by um, the guards. And there was a lawsuit. Um, So the next question um, is, um, I think maybe more for Dr. Weems. Um, So in terms of less access to the PPP program, how can a new aid program address this problem? Well, uh, I I think first of all, and, and I think we're really beginning to see uh, audits of the PPP program taking place where we saw a vast majority of that money, you know, not going to small businesses at all, but going to a variety of, of, of large corporations, I, I think. And one can only hope that, you know, in a, in a Biden presidency, that that will be one of the issues that will be addressed to make sure that monies designated for small businesses will actually uh, assist small businesses because uh, one of the realities of small business is that, you know, small businesses actually employ the majority of people in this country. And if we see the erosion and the disappearance of small businesses, you know, that, that has an enormous impact, not just for the you know, the entrepreneurs who started those businesses, but for people that work for them and, and, and what these businesses contributed to tax bases and, and the like, because to, you know, to me, you know, that is, you know, uh, an an extremely important topic that I don't think has really received, you know, the attention it's deserved because there's been this stress. We need to reopen. We need to reopen. Uh, But, again, to look at the nuances of this reopening and and what is being done to help small business people and especially small African-American business people really hasn't been a a major part of the discussion up to this point. Absolutely. Um, So there is another question um, for Dr. Beaupre. Um, do you have any ideas about why the, canv- the Kansas COVID-19 rate for incarcerated African Americans was higher than among whites? Um, what may be going on in the prison to produce this type of within prison outcome? Yeah, hi Marty. Um, so my answer is not going to be great because the article where I gained that information didn't have an exact answer of why. We just know it's happening right now. Um, speculation is that just as racism and access to healthcare on the outside is an issue for the Black community, it's impacting them on the inside as well. I think that alone would be an excellent research project for somebody to take on uh, because it is an important issue. and. You know, we know about lack of access to healthcare on the outside among the Black community. We know about subpar medical conditions on the inside. If somebody could combine those two interests and kind of search into why this is happening, particularly in COVID-19 context, that would be an amazing study. 
I sadly do not have an answer for you. But that that would be my speculation is just like access to healthcare on the outside, it's even heightened on the inside for people of color. Um, absolutely. And I, I was just going to mention before we move on, I believe there is a branch of medicine um, devoted specifically to um, medical treatment provided to people who are incarcerated. So this is a big area of study. I myself, I'm obviously not an expert on it. Um, it's called desmeteric. Hmm. Maria, you're on mute. Yes, thank you so much. I, I have like a little button that is connected. And uh, um, so anyway, sorry, okay. uh, a branch of medicine um, that studies medical treatment of people who are incarcerated. Um, I've put in the chat, um, it's desmeteric medicine. Uh, so um, there's another question. Um, are there any organizations working on improving health, education, and outcomes in diverse communities, especially in Kansas or in Wichita? Oh, well, I, I you know, I, I can't speak definitively on that, but I am on such local organization. There's a local Black Nurses Association that, you know, even before the pandemic, you know, part of his mission was to, you know, engage in, you know, education in the African American community on health issues. I know they're, they've sponsored a variety of health fairs over the years. And, and I would assume that, you know, the, you know, the Black Nurses Association, you know, has some programs in place to, to deal with uh, uh, COVID-19. Absolutely. And if I'm remembering correctly, the panel, um, the Fairmount College um, perspectives on the pandemic, there was a panel of um, health experts. Um, and I remember in particular, Health Corps um, has put a lot of effort into getting um, information out into the community and providing medical care. Um, so I, I have another question that um, I believe is, is, um, for Dr. Weems, um, so not to be, <laughs> so um, minority communities have historically not been active in vaccination campaigns in proportion to their percentage of the population. So what are some effective tactics um, to reach these populations to participate in greater volume? Uh, th that's a great question. And I saw my colleague, George Neener, uh, put that forward. Uh, when we talk about, you know, African Americans and, and, and vaccinations and, and, and the health system in general, you know, again, referring to history, uh, there are some specific episodes and one in particular that over the years has really mitigated, you know, African American participation in various medical studies and vac vac vaccine programs. Uh, the most heinous of these was the infamous Tuskegee experiment that literally was conducted for over 40 years, where poor black uh, sharecroppers for the most part in Alabama who had syphilis were being studied to literally look at how syphilis, you know, progressed in, in, in the body. And, and, and the despicable thing about this particular program was that after penicillin had been identified as something to eradicate syphilis, the participants in this study were not given penicillin and literally were allowed to die to study the pro progression of a disease that would pretty much not life-threatening with the advent of penicillin. And Tuskegee is one of these episodes that even a lot of non-historians are have been well aware of over the years. And there's just sort of an anecdotal dynamic in African-American communities where there's a fear of going to the hospital, you know, where, you know, people go to the hospital and die there. So th there's all types of historical dynamics, which I think has kept African-Americans very reluctant to participate, but be that as it may, 
when we look at how African Americans are disproportionately affected by COVID-19, from a purely medical standpoint, it does make sense for more African Americans who, and there is an increasing number of African Americans who are willing to step forward and be part of these types of trials, but, but history has, has really uh, been an impediment, I think, to you know, sort of a widespread African American enthusiasm for participating in vaccine trials. Absolutely. And um, I believe there has been some, you know, recent attention drawn to the high rates of mortality of Black women in particular who um, give birth in hospitals. I know even Serena Williams, the famous tennis star, said that um, her claims about how she was feeling after she gave birth were disregarded by the medical staff, and she had to essentially continue to ask them to pay attention to what was going on with her. Um, and it was good that they did because she had something that was potentially life-threatening. So in terms of when people, black people go into hospitals um, and then they die, I mean, we're seeing that in particular with black women um, who give birth, which is deeply, deeply concerning um, amidst everything else that is deeply concerning right now. Um, I do see another question. Um, so Dr. Beaupre, do you have information about how language barriers may impact health? I don't, but I will say that prisons um, are very white and Eurocentric. Uh, so even the staff, the majority are white men versus, you know, when we look at the incarcerated population, it's much more diverse. And so that has implications for access to information and translating things into different languages. I can't give you an exact answer. Um, so that's, that's my vague answer to that question. Um, but I do want to share, piggying back off of the last question um, about ethics and research. Um, I attended this really amazing webinar this morning about Black Lives Matter and research. And so I'm sharing uh, the link to that webinar. It was recorded. So I would highly recommend any researchers on here to check that out. It talked about, you know, white normativity and supremacy, even in the IRB process that disadvantages black researchers and therefore black communities. And so I, it was a very eye-opening panel that I think might be of interest to people here. And what sparked, you know, my connection to that was the Tuskegee study and also just talking about ethics in general. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, it brings to mind for me to um, the case of Henrietta Lacks, of course, whose DNA was used for a really, really long period of time, has been used for almost every um, serious medical um, breakthrough, um, and her family was not, <laughs> not compensated. Um, so, Dr. Weems, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, for that last question. Well, well, I guess one thing I, I do want to bring up, and you know, this week, you know, we got some very encouraging news about a, a vaccine that uh, the trial show has, you know, 90% effectiveness. And, and again, you know, one cannot discount the positivity associated with that. But then, you know, the $64,000 question becomes how are these vaccines going to be distributed? And, and indeed, going back to historic disparities, will this be yet another instance where, you know, African-Americans find themselves at the end of the line in terms of access to the vaccine, where when we look at the numbers, one would think that African-Americans would be a top priority in terms of having access uh, to to this vaccine and others that that will appear in the next several months. Absolutely, um, and I I'll take a second here. Um, we got a question at the beginning that was fairly long, and it was from my colleague Nathan. Um, so I don't want to read it aloud because I'm not sure if I'll really convey um, what he's asking. So Nathan, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question?
it, 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 I got to feel like it was kind of out of scope. So <laughs> it, it wasn't asking for a hopeful thing. It was just about the nature of systems and how it's just the identification of systemic disparity seems possible in any system because it's the nature of a system to be making differences and prioritizing and organizing anything, whatever the subject matter is from numbers to taxonomy to societies. But uh, what I wondered about is something positive, like what could be hopeful changes in a systemic scenario that wouldn't result in just alternate disparities and I, I would love to hear both of your thoughts on that, but I don't know really quite how to ask it clearly. But it would help for movement because I feel like talking about the protests and a lot of different things that we've experienced over many years, decades, um, the switches just change disparities rather than assist in making a system that has less of them. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense to me. Um, and when you ask that question, it may I think I think the one positive of the pandemic is I've been attending a lot of webinars like in my free time, which is great. So this week I went to one that was hosted by a group of black women scholars from all across the nation. And something that they brought up rightfully so is that this system is operating the way it's intended. There are policies and things in place that specifically disadvantage people of color and black, and black people specifically. So if we wanna change the system, if we want to actually do the work of anti-racism, we have to make serious changes in our system, which includes addressing policies that are racist. We can talk all day about implicit biases that doesn't address systemic racism. That's putting a Band-Aid on a bigger issue. So if, if we actually want to do this work, we need to address both systemic racism through the policies in the criminal justice system. Again, starting with the decisions to stop and search through to who we are incarcerating. And a part of that is also addressing white supremacy and addressing, you know, that certain people are benefiting from this system relative to others. So that's that's my advice. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Weems reply too, and I'm going to post in the chat some resources for addressing anti-racism in the criminal justice system while he talks. <laughs> yeah, as in most things, um exposure to uh, scholarship can, can, can be a helpful anecdote. You know, one book that immediately comes to mind for me, and this is a book that I've used in my class, uh, several my his, African-American history class several times, is Ira Katz Nelson's classic book, When Affirmative Action Was White, where he literally documents how uh, from the New Deal, especially during World War II, uh, Harry Truman's Square Deal, were programs that were literally established to, in fact, give preference to people of European descent and conversely uh, pose additional obstacles to people of, 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 of African descent. Uh, African descent. And, and Katz Nelson, I think, does a, a very good job in, in clearly articulating that, you know, notions of racism and bias are more than just sort of, you know, individual phenomena, that they're literally baked into the political system, and they have been baked into the political system for quite some time. And that's, again, going back to the importance of voting, because if you have more people in an office that are sensitive to this history and, and maybe and are concerned about changing this history, that's how it gets done. Because it's so, it's so interesting how when we look at, at uh, the 1970s, especially, you know, affirmative action literally became 
a quote unquote bad word in the minds of, of some whites because it sort of uh, reflected, you know, undeserving black people getting special benefits. And, and, and another thing I'll just leave people with is that literally the first affirmative action program had nothing to do with race. It was actually the first affirmative action program was a small business administration because in the American you know, economic system, you know, small businesses operate at a distinct disadvantage to large corporations. And the Small Business Administration was indeed set up to allow small businesses to, in fact, achieve some level of viability in the US economy. And, and there's been really no criticism of the Small Business Administration. Well, let me take that back. When the Small Business Administration started addressing the issue of Black entrepreneurs in the 60s, that's when the SBA came under attack. But again, this whole notion of affirmative action to address systemic problems is, is, is you know, we have numerous instances of that in history. And, and again, uh, the, the Small Business Administration, I think is the most classic case of an affirmative action program that has nothing to do with race, but has everything to do with literally leveling, you know, the proverbial playing field. Absolutely. And we do have another question. Um, so what do you think of requiring a term or year of African American history of everyone who gets a degree from WSU? And if I can tack on to that, I'm thinking about um, what Mark McCormick called for in his um, convocation. I always get convocation and commencement confused. His convocation speech at the beginning of this year calling for a, a program at Wichita State um, to focus on critical race theory. Uh, go, go ahead, Professor Bobri. Oh, I mean, I, I would just say that's a great idea. Um, I, think, I think even individual programs can have, you know, classes required specifically addressing these issues in those fields. I know in criminal justice, we have sort of like a multiculturalism class um, to address these issues. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm 100% on board with that. I think that is a great idea. Yeah, well, you know, it, it might appear self-serving from coming from me who who I teach courses in African American history to believe that that's a good idea. But I would argue from a from a pedagogical standpoint that you literally can't know American history or think you know American history unless you know something about the African American experience because without knowing the African American experience, that's the proverbial donut with a big hole in, in, in the middle. And again, by having access to this additional information, in fact, it might provide people with a different perspective as to how certain contemporary realities came into existence. Absolutely. Um, and, and while you're speaking, that actually just brought to mind um, because I've studied a little bit um, censorship in libraries and prisons um, and jails and um, books that are frequently censored um, are books that involve um, African-American history, um, Latinx history, um, basically any history that is not white, um, which is so deeply concerning for a number of reasons. Um, one of which is as Dr. Bopri has pointed out, um, the majority of the prison population um, are minorities, are people of color. Um, and it's also deeply concerning because as you point out, Dr. Weems, this history is part of American history. You can't actually understand our history if you don't understand um, everything about it. And so that's something that has been, um, you know, one of the many concerns that librarians have about censorship um, in prisons, um, in carceral, libraries. Um, so that was sort of just a final note. <laughs> um, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, so is there anything else, Dr. Weems or Dr. Bopre, you'd like to add before we wrap up? Um, I added a couple links in the chat. Um, so there's a Medium article that talks about what white people specifically can do for racial justice. 
And some of the tips on there are related specifically to criminal justice. And so I would recommend checking that out. I think, you know, something that my friends from graduate school and I did during the pandemic and, you know, during the, the national protests and things is we did these activities together, you know? So I think that having more spaces and community around racial injustice and acting against it would be very helpful. And if Wichita State could facilitate that, I think that could actually make meaningful changes. Um, conversations like these are awesome, but I think that we do need more action as well. Absolutely. Yeah, just to, to piggyback off that point, you know, first of all, I appreciate the invitation to participate uh, in today's um, uh, program, but Again, to follow up on Professor Bopre's point, it's just like uh, reading the Bible. You know, there's certain verses that might be particularly, particularly compelling to you, but they're meaningless unless you act upon them. Uh, the same way when we look at issues related to racial fairness, uh, we could read all sorts of books, we could have all sorts of discussions, but until we actively go out in our own ways to promote racial fairness. Again, this just, just becomes a hour and a half feel good session that has limited, you know, uh, real impact afterwards. Absolutely. Um, I do want to just add here, um, because we have um, a guide connected to this panel series, um, we will be adding all the links that Dr. Beaupre has shared um, during the chat today. So those will be available. Um, this session is being recorded um, and that recording should be up and available by the end of next week. So before um, our Thanksgiving break starts, we'd like to have that up and we're just going to take the time to caption it properly. Um, and I want to first off thank our panelists um, for taking the time to participate um, in this really important discussion um, amidst a really um, unusual wild semester <laughs> that we're having. Um, and I also want to thank um, Ginger Williams, um, who has helped uh, in the planning of this session. Um, Kathy Downs, the Dean of the Library, who's also supported this panel series. Um, this is the final um, session for this semester. Um, and that's pretty much it. I should also thank Megan Kuhlman, um, who's the one who's organized everything, and my um, colleague, Ethan, um, for moderating this discussion with me. Is there anything else you wanted to mention, Ethan? No, I don't think so. I, I would just say that the library does, you know, we're, we're actively purchasing books in, in the areas of uh, um, African American history, uh, Thing, issues, uh, books that address issues of anti-racism, things, things like that. So, so we do have a lot available. Absolutely. Um, and I, you know, in education, I'm also focused on purchasing books that deal with um, issues of anti-racism in relation to education. So we're focused on um, developing and diversifying our collection um, so that it includes information about these really important and relevant topics. Um, with that, um, I think I'll let Megan, um, she's the one recording, so I'll let her end the session if that's all right, Megan. Sounds good. And again, just thank you to our panelists for joining us. And thank you, Maria and Ethan, for um, excellent moderation and everyone in our audience for being here today as well. Um, and I definitely encourage you to, um, to go to the Researching the Pandemic Guide um, by tomorrow. I should have all those links available as well as um, the recording from the first session is available now. So if you're interested, that one was about um, scholarship and, and how research is conducted during this very interesting pandemic time. So great, thank you very much and um, have a good rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>